Landscape architect Matthew Urbanski is a principal in the New York-based practice of Michael Van Valkenburg Associates. Jack Oley is senior project manager at Van Valkenburg. Mr. Oley will discuss the firm's work as landscape master planner for the Menil collection, and Mr. Urbanski will follow with the discussion of Van Valkenburg Associates' approach to the second phase master plan for Herman Park. So the Manila Collection is a, it's an art collection, it's a museum, it's a neighborhood of art that was created by the tireless activist, humanist, experimentalist, Catholic revivalist forces of nature, John and Dominique de Manil, who emigrated from France to Houston during World War II and uh, stayed here until their deaths in 1973 and 1997 respectively. Uh, it's in the Montrose neighborhood, um, southwest of downtown. Almost 30 acres of land that they've acquired since the 60s, but the core of it, Rothko Chapel, that was the first piece uh, with Philip Johnson and Rothko uh, in the early 70s, and then built around that um, was the main museum by Renzo Piano, which was completed in 87, Cy Twombly, um, you know, about eight years after that. That's the sort of the core with the gray painted bungalows um, from the 20s that still surround it, creating the, what's known as the necklace. But the actual ownership and the land extends way beyond that, and um, some of the elements extend beyond that as well. So uh, Charles mentioned the Lou Kahn plan, which was an attempt to address a non-monumental architecture that Dominique de Manil and John de Manil wanted a sort of a personal engagement with art, something that was not separated, that was not put up on a, on a high pedestal and to be, you know, worshipped at, but rather something to be engaged with. This was a little bit too much erasure for Dominique and not park-like enough for her, um, but it was also cut short by Khan's death very shortly after. John died, John de Manil died within nine months. So there was a, a period of time, but they engaged with Renzo Piano and developed, this is the site plan, uh, I think this is from the 90s after Twombly was completed, but uh, it preserved a lot of the neighborhood and relied on the neighborhood for the character and the setting of the museum. And it was a process of selective erasure, basically, that they created. There was no landscape architect. Dominique de Manil was, I think, basically the landscape architect. She said, this stays, this goes move this plant from my house, you know, the archive, I looked at the landscape folder, has, you know, a business card from a gardening center, it has a few unrequited solicitations from landscape architects who were interested. Uh, they just, they just did it. They moved some bungalows, they created the space, and they wanted it to be very much an extension of that neighborhood that they, that they created this place in. And, it's a, it's a radical and remarkable beginning, and it's, a, and it's created something that is, um, it's fluid and eclectic and welcoming. Um, there's this sort of interesting ambiguity between residential and institutional spaces. You're moving between, you know, through backyard, basically, in this, but this is a, this is a walkway through office bungalows. That's the museum in the background. This is a park that was created by just taking away the bungalows and fences and leaving the backyards connected and it's extremely well used. It feels like a public park. People think it's a public park. And the, you know, the more classical setting of art and architecture that is the north side of the museum with the Michael Heiser. So there's a range, there's a great range in the place. There's also some very unconsidered spaces that are not welcoming. Those are those are Tony Smith's sculptures, those aren't transformers in there. Uh, and there's a process by which it becomes a little bit poorer over time without that driving vision or, you know, it's the cycles of maintenance, the, you know, the institutionalization of things. You no longer have the homeowners with the vernacular of the different front yards. Uh, and so it can be, it becomes a little blander and can start to feel a little bit just like a typical inside outside bias. We care a lot about art and architecture, landscape not as much. So we actually didn't do a master plan for the Manila Collection. Uh, Chipperfield did a master plan for the Manila Collection in 2009, which included this green spine concept for extending the institution. Um, this is after a period of relative inactivity following Dominique's death. 
and we came on in 2012 to take that framework with the new drawing institute, which at that point, Johnston Mark Lee had won the design competition for. They knew what the first step was in the expansion of this campus. And um, we kind of expanded on the master plan concept and brought an approach to the landscape, which was to first and foremost assure them that they could keep everything that was good about the Manila Collective. We would not lose that. You know, we could amplify the wonderful juxtapositions and the eclectic nature of the place but we could add all of this richness that was really an extension of the, the kind of the core values of the museum and what makes it so dynamic and exciting. Bring that sort of outside, that there's a corollary in the landscape that can exist for these very daring and innovative ways of bringing art and culture into the city. So there's three phases. Only one is built, that's the first one, and that's what I'll be talking about today. The other two I'm not going to talk about, really, but I'll acknowledge them. That's the Drawing Institute, which is under construction right now, which is a very exciting project. And then the South Campus organized around a park, which is uh, still in concept. So the Gateway, as uh, Stephen mentioned, is a parking lot. <laughs> and we finished it early last year. This was the old parking lot. It was low-key in the Manila fashion, um, so low-key that board members didn't realize it was connected to the museum. <laughs> and it had a kind of almost indifferent attitude about the entryway. You know, the Jim Love sculpture let you know where to go, otherwise you sort of cut through and found your way to the museum and then you were okay. And it also had a big flooding problem. So it had this row of live oaks in the central island, that was the sort of the spine that we wanted to preserve and improve on, and with the change in parking regulations, we couldn't do that because the stalls needed to be deeper. We would have lost those live oaks. So we, we turned uh, the parking 45 degrees, made it one way, made a connection over to Mandel, and we expanded the central island to create swales and interior pathways and understory trees, chalk maples, a native rare uh, understory tree of the southeast so that you would move through, on the inside of the cars, you would move along these swale gardens between the live oaks and the chalk maples, and that it would be an experience. Your experience begins when you arrive, not after you've sort of fumbled your way to the museum. And it also included a 8,000 cubic foot water storage tank, and that was driven in part because we didn't have enough drop in this dead flat space with the Mandel connection to connect into the pipes. So all of that water percolates down through the swales and the tree pits in the central island, hits under drains, goes around to the cistern, and then is recycled back to irrigate the landscape. So there's the concrete work going in, there it is. Shortly after planting, you can see the fall color of the chalk maples, which is, is wonderful. And this was a shot I took last November as it's starting to grow in. So it's a sort of an inversion where you're in the most landscape, you know, the most textured environment of a garden as you're in the parking lot. And then you come out into a more kind of residential, uh, institutional landscape as you transition towards the museum. That's the new restaurant, Bistro Manil, that Stern and Butek designed with its uh, patio overlooking the parking lot. And there's the bookstore. So it's a, you know, it's a backyard, but it's a backyard that you're welcome in, welcomed into and will feel more welcomed into when we install our tables and benches in the next two weeks. And then that leads you to the, to the museum and the heart of the campus. So as we move south and invent new landscape for the Manila Collection, it's a very exciting project. We are taking that same responsive idea of continuity through the variation, through, the, through all that juxtaposition and transition that is, you know, what makes the place so wonderful out into this, into this new territory. Thank you. And now in eight minutes and through a few uh, violent leaps, I am gonna try to connect what I see is um, emblematic of Jack and Michael's work at Manil of Houston at large is leap into landscape imagination. There's a kind of embrace uh, of, of the imaginative power of landscape that is really emerging and is what is making me excited about working on the Herman Park master plan for the next 20 years, which I can't actually show you any ideas of yet, but I'll, sh I'll explain the challenges, which is another way of showing you ideas. So 
as Jane showed you all, um, there were some problems in Herman Park and a lot of progress has been made. And there has been some dazzling axial and I guess easier to sell to a donor, um, but really fantastic new landscapes that were made here. Maybe the parking lot was a harder sell on that than than the mount was, but it's it's quite spectacular. And coming to work in Houston after this work has been done is why I want to work here. This is an unbelievable accomplishment. As Jane really skillfully and then Lori's uh, angry drawing explained to you already, I think uh, you understand the conundrum of Herman Park. Wow, 445 acres, that's just amazing. Well, you got to take out all those parts that was already explained. This is a little bit more generous version of uh, Lori's drawing, and then you have the new parts that have been done, and what is left are a bunch of scrappy edges and parking lots and awful thresholds. And my worry, and why, in a way I want to bring this up, is these are hard things to excite philanthropists about, I think, right? But these are the things that need work in Herman Park, and guess what? These are the things that need work in Houston, too. It's all of these scrappy edges, and if we really apply some landscape imagination to these scrappy edges, I think we can do something great, but it will take a leap of imagination. As Stephen said, uh, I do think as, as uh, people have seen something, they start to believe. They don't really believe drawings as we landscape architects know, but once we get them into something, they finally start to believe, and I believe there's been such great accomplishment here now that I'm very happy to be involved. But you know what? I showed you those postcard views. This is really how people experience Herman Park, if they're going to be honest with you, right? This is coming up Herman Park Drive. That is the zoo, and it's only one of its many maintenance entrances on the left, and those are parking lots as far as the eye can see in every other direction. This is, I think, charitably described as traffic triage, which is what happens every single Saturday that is nice, where people are asked to do things that they really don't want to do with cars. This is your typical Saturday experience, finally, when you finally make it to the middle. This is the zoo's relationship with Cambridge Street. This is the worst, but it is very bad also. That's the, the medical center on the left, so we're really tight up against it here. And then there are a tremendously challenging thresholds all the way around Herman Park. This one on Fannin, uh, anyone in Houston knows, is occupied by a kind of standing army of um, Kush dealers trying to, you know, intimidate you into never wanting to go in. I didn't have to pose that picture at all. And then, you know, there are a couple of underutilized landscapes. One here, probably the largest unprogrammed space given over to a sculpture. So these scrappy uh, landscapes are really our opportunity to make a connected landscape. Houston is all about connection, and but how can we make it an, an immersive, how can we make something that feels like you're in a park? Just to step out to the scale of Houston, Houston's success and its shortcoming, as has been pointed out a few times already with statistics, is a product of its hyper-connectivity. I mean, this is why it's great and this is why it sucks at the same time, right? This is what we have to deal with. This is absolutely everything that Houston is about. Um, and a landscape needs to be about that as well. Comey, in his brilliance, came up with an idea of a connected uh, public space network all the way back 100, more than 100 years ago, as was, has been shown already. And the Houston Park Board is taking this idea and expanding it across the vast stretch of Houston. It's an absolutely, unbelievably great idea. And when I look at this landscape, this, you know, the neoclassical ponds, those were imported ideas. Even the idea of just grabbing a big chunk of land like Memorial Park as a reserve, you know, and just saving it, that was an imported idea. This idea of making a civic landscape that is absolutely dovetailed with the natural geomorphology of this site, with the flow of water over and through, with a living system that's not too neat, that's growing and changing, that's going to be torn out a bit with the next flood. This is an absolutely novel achievement and a fantastic um, thing, and I really think it's very, very distinguishing um, for the city. So, in a way, when you're working on a new space, what we've been talking about is nature and culture here. And the idea that a landscape is coming out of the nature of the site and out of the culture, the cultural site, but also really out of landscape, starting with landscape, okay? What we're not starting with um, here is frantic programming, okay? What we're not starting with here 
is glitzy art, you know, that worked really well in Millennium Park, but to me it doesn't seem like the right answer here in Houston. What we're not starting with is too much architectural dependence either, right? We have a lot of built things already. What we're talking about is inventing from the medium of landscape and from the capacity of the medium of landscape to connect with people. So when we look at Central Park, Central Park, you know, Olmsted's incredible leap was to say that the Catskills, depicted in the Durant painting, unbelievable leap that he made to say that the Catskills should be the civic platform, that could be a civic, the platform for a civic coming together, a civic landscape. I mean, it's so unintuitive in a way, and he's so right. It's the only thing in New York that functions the same exact way as it was designed 150 years ago. But the fact that he did that, the fact that Central Park exists, is why we could make Teardrop Park. Okay, this thing in this little canyon of buildings down in Battery Park City, this would be ridiculous in another city. This works because people in New York understand what a public landscape is that, and it has its own steady and roots, okay? So in Pittsburgh, you have the Allegheny River and the, the flooding and violence of it and the beautiful way that plants have adapted to grow along it. We also have the civic landscapes of Point State Park and other places. And our, and our park here that we did in the early 90s is kind of a coalescing of that natural and that uh, civic landscape, uh, civic on the top here, natural on the bottom. And then finally, another example of that, inventing from landscape, is looking at the kind of rugged coastal landscapes of the Northeast and the civic landscapes of New York, in this case, the Brooklyn Heights Promenade, and them fusing together in a new imaginative way in, in Brooklyn Bridge Park. So I think we need to invent from and embrace landscape imagination in thinking about the future of Houston's landscape.